Now there's all kinds of different people in this world. There's only one high. Welcome to the Team Made Apart podcast, the podcast designed to teach freelancers, contractors, and remote workers, really anyone working apart, how to build better relationships with those they work with and those they work for. I'm your host, Ryan Rogar. Before we get started, financial support for the Team Made Apart podcast is provided by R2, a fully distributed brand relationship consultancy. R2 has specific expertise and experience in helping service companies grow, develop, and maintain impactful relationships through world-class brand strategy and design. R2 supports the world's best distributed companies by providing valuable insights, strategy, empathy, and tactical expertise to help them foster truly meaningful relationships from top management to top consumer. If the success of your business depends on the relationships you make, then you need R2. To learn more or to request a call, simply visit r2mg.com slash podcast. That's r2mg.com slash podcast. R2, relationships squared. Also, financial support comes from teammateapart.com. Leveraging 20 plus years of global agency and creative hiring expertise, Teammate Apart provides distributed organizations with access to the best and brightest creative talent from around the world. Through deep understanding of client needs and meaningful relationships with talent, Teammate Apart facilitates a sort of virtual handshake between prospective employer and prospective employee to reduce risk and eliminate doubt from creative hiring decisions. Take a step towards filling that creative-shaped void in your distributed team by visiting teammateapart.com slash talent. That's teammateapart.com slash talent to learn more. Finally, financial support comes from supporters like you. Members of our Happy Little Podcast community can make contributions directly to the show by visiting teammateapart.com slash podcast and clicking on the donation link. Donations can be made in any amount and would go a long way towards keeping this show on the air. If you appreciate the work we're doing and would like to get involved, just visit teammateapart.com slash podcast, click the donate button, and you're on your way. Thanks in advance for your continued support. And now, on to the show. Hey there, and welcome back to the Teammate Apart Podcast. Today's special guest is Daphne Lefloy. Daphne is a distributed workplace consultant and host of the Remote First podcast. She is on a mission to help executives, people ops, and team leaders to drive company-wide shifts towards remote first ways of working. In more than 10 years of working with fully distributed companies, she has a long history of playing key roles in establishing scalable workflows for growth, facilitating business decisions remotely, and building internal products dedicated to support remote first teams. Daphne believes that understanding the way we work plays an essential role in creating successful, distributed by design workplaces, and is a key element in creating memorable employee experiences. For an exciting conversation about how we can most effectively support our teams in their return to the office in a hybrid way, improving employee well being through flexibility, empowerment, and trust, asynchronous and transparent communication, and how we can coach and educate our teams to be better facilitators. Please join me in welcoming to the show our guest, Daphne Lefore. Hey, Daphne, how are you? Good, I'm good. Thank you for, for bringing me in. Of course. No, and I see a smile on your face, so I, I'm just going to air out my dirty laundry about my pronunciation of your name. I did my level best, I swear to God. <laughs> no, it was perfect. It was perfect. <laughs> it's nice to hear French from uh, other people, uh, but my name also is, is called Lafore sometime, Lafore. I'm Canadian, so my, my name is quite bilingual. Okay, perfect. Well, as long as you're not offended, right? That's the goal is to try and no, be, try and not. handle people the right way. So anyway, um, one thing I've been trying to do at the beginning of all these shows recently is just to find out where you're calling in from today. I'm calling in actually from Montreal, Canada. I am uh, lucky to be able to come uh, of the visit for my family for one week for family reasons. So um, yeah, I'm here and I'm lucky that remote work enables me to be able to come here for a week for being closer to my family. That's awesome. Well, and we're glad to have you closer to us too here in the States, especially with my bad French. So- I'm usually based in Berlin though. <laughs> For those who listen and want to know, like I'm Canadian, but based in Berlin and living there permanently. Excellent. Well, I do like too the, the sort of practice what you preach thing, right? The whole re- doing remote work and, and uh, demonstrating it on something like this, I kind of love. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about just sort of, I guess, the beginning, sort of your early days, how you got started in remote and, uh, you know, basic, you know, how, what that story looked like. 
Um, so for me, quite it started um, back in 2012, where I was traveling around the world. It all started around, you know, the reason behind why we want to be remote, because I, I was looking for flexibility. I was trying to find a way to continue to travel, do something that I really love, um, you know, and be able to do it full time or in a longer term than just two weeks a year, which is in Canada in my early 20s, when I was looking at my career, what I wanted I had to think about the fact that I only have two weeks per year to take a vacation, to travel, to do what I love and be on holiday or something like that. And I was like, there's no way I can just do that. I have to find another way. So in my early 20s, I tried to build my my career around the fact that I could work online to be able to make a living and continue to do what I love. And um, since then, so since 2012, I've been uh, working remotely first as a freelancer and I kind of tried to find out what kind of career I could have that way. Um, I started with marketing and project management that had some contracts and slowly also got into product management and also joined a fully remote company in 2015, where I actually experienced the whole remote worker experience as a full-time employee in a remote company while continuing to travel once in a while. It doesn't have to be all the time. Right now it's impossible, but um, it was kind of what started it was really becoming, I want to be able to fit my work around my life and not the other way around. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think that's actually sort of the inspiration for a lot of people to get into remote is this idea of sort of balancing out life a little bit. Would you yeah. have considered yourself sort of nomadic? Like, I mean, are you one of these uh, digital nomad types or did you just sort of uh, enjoy travel, you know, but not necessarily, you know, week to week? I used to be extremely into the digital nomad movement when back in 2014, 15, I was, I built a app for nomads. Uh, I was like really, really in the community of nomads at the beginning. Um, and it's, it's normal because at the beginning I was try, mostly trying to find other people like me. I was trying to think, oh, actually there is other people who are also looking for that kind of lifestyle or some, or something. Um, so yeah, I've definitely been like very involved in this. And then uh, after, at the same time, I was really trying to get the word out, not just for the individual, but also for, for companies. Because I was realizing that I had, I was lucky I had a, a job in a remote company, but for most of the people I was meeting, they were either entrepreneurs, uh, you know, freelancers trying to build, a, make a living with small little um, jobs to be able to make a living and travel. And I was like, there's just not enough jobs like to tr I tried to apply for a remote job at that time was very difficult you had to really there's a, a the number that we know we know buffer zapier um automatic like all these names but then for people to apply there was a lot less opportunities so for me I was like I need to build more information for companies to create more jobs and to create more remote work opportunities so that more people will have a lifestyle like mine. So that was a bit like where I was going. And then I started to get more involved in creating the conference about, I was calling in quote, corporate remote work, which is like at that time was just very new to have these companies talk about how they're able to manage their company remotely and everything. That was very new at that time. And now, I mean, this content is basically obsolete today, <laughs> just after two years of pandemic or a year and a half. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. I, I especially like the, I guess, the awareness or the attention that you put on sort of how does how do you make remote work for corporations? I think mm -hmm. that there's a tendency in sort of that nomadic movement, and this is probably a gross generalization, so I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I think that there's sort of a, a, a an inclination that it's really more about that person's experience, right? Like they want to travel, they want to go do this and that, and mm -hmm. they just want somebody to kind of finance that as they move around. And I think that just by its nature, or at least maybe more, more maybe more so in the early days, not as much with people who have sort of permanent employment. But, um, you know, it seems like maybe in those early days, it was a little bit more about how can work finance what it is that I want to do. And, I, and I'll do the minimum I need to do to do that versus this idea of fostering a longer form relationship with a company or, you know, in your case, actually going even one step further in teaching remote companies how to do or teaching companies how to become remote or how to leverage a remote workforce. And so I think that that's really wise that you were able to sort of see that even from a sort of nomadic perspective. I was thinking about it actually at the beginning on why why we do remote. And I did start by the individual. At the beginning, we talked a lot about how it creates benefits for the individual as like, you know, more flexible, they're close to their family, they can be um, traveling. But you're also 
by hiring a, a remote workforce or a workforce that is flexible, you're actually enabling people to be much happier in their uh, day-to-day life and then happier employees, happier teams create better work together. So it's not, I try to make it look a bit more like this is not just about wanting to be sweet as an employer. You can also just create a really amazing culture that's going to make people excited to do their work and not want to leave your company because they are so um, full of benefits that is making them stick around because they just feel like this is actually a really cool lifestyle that it's giving me and I wouldn't be able to have that somewhere else. Well, and I think that's true. I mean, basically this dialogue you created between sort of the nomadic worker or the remote worker and the corporations or through, you know, these different businesses, that dialogue going both ways really does start to begin to foster a relationship instead of this idea of me, the nomad looking out for me and what I want. And, you know, the employer in a silo thinking about how can we, you know, uh, have loyal employees or how do we keep people happy? You know, rather it's this two way dialogue where it's like me as a remote worker, these are the reasons that I want to work remote and you as a company, you understand those reasons and actually work actively to try and encourage them. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you sort of meet in the middle and what you build is this relationship, right? You build this, you know, two way street instead of this one way thing where it's all benefiting the employee or all in benefiting the employer. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and so I think that that, that relationship, I mean, obviously it builds more loyalty. It makes it easier for people who are nomadic or for people who, you know, maybe just want to work remote from home. You know, it gives them more, freedom to do that sort of work. And then they can also do it with sort of some stability in life. You can feel like, you know, you know where your next check's coming from, that kind of thing. You know, I come from a a freelance background where for many, many years, you know, there was no clear, uh, you know, thing on the horizon where we knew we were getting paid next. And so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I imagine a lot of nomads have that same experience, you know, where they're sort of, except for they're in a foreign country and they they don't know how they're going to get to the next one. And, uh, Definitely. yeah, so I think that there's really something to this two way conversation being facilitated. And I love that you sort of kicked that off, you know, from an early, uh, early point. There's something important also is that the probably like that would say that we used to be the millennials that were like, we are the young people, but then now like <laughs> maybe less, <laughs> but then, you know, people want careers. They don't want necessarily all the time to just be freelancing they also want to feel that they're growing they have they have professional growth and they do many people do want to work in companies that will challenge them that will make them grow in their own skills so there it's not because these people who are trying to have a lifestyle or a life that represents them means that they they because of that they don't want to have a career and that's why it's important to have companies who are also enabling that. And it's really best of both worlds for having lived it to be able to feel like you have a strong career and you're able to have the the life that you want with your family, with the, the place you want to live, the weather you want. Um, there's amazing things to it, which right now we are not living. Many people are not living that benefits of of remote work or the, the flexibility mostly. I don't call it remote work as much more, much more as a flexible work is there is so many benefits that comes with it. That is, and once you touch it, I always say, once you touch it, you cannot come back to it. You cannot come back to the normal. You just can't. Yeah. Well, and it's funny cause it, I mean, it's a very evolutionary thing, right? I mean, and maybe we're just the right age for this. You mentioned, and what made me think of this was this idea that the millennials are now getting older, right? For a moment, they were the, the hot young yeah. things, but now all of a sudden we're the hot young things with families and kids. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but what's really cool about, you know, and, and I think really speaks to the flexibility of remote work is how it's evolved with the people doing the work, right? I mean, there is of course, a, you know, new generations of people coming into remote work all the time, but the people who are sort of a a big part of these early days or the early movement, maybe people that have been in the job, uh, job market, maybe the last 20, 25 years, something like that. Those people have made work flexible to the point that it evolves and changes as we evolve and changes people. Right. So, I mean, the, the needs of the nomad who, you know, just really needs to spring for a hostel and a little bit of food are a little bit different than the person who might have a child or two and, you know, has a a house to take care of or a mortgage to pay or something. And, you know, it just sort of happens by evolution. Just we tend to get older. We tend to settle down. We tend to have kids. We tend to do these different things that are just sort of part of our biology. But I think what's really cool about remote work is that remote work done right, you know, bends and shapes and molds to fit that, whatever our life situation is. 
Definitely. That I now when I when I travel, for example, when it was possible or when I'm actually imagining what it will be like when things reopen, I want my son to go to like a green school somewhere in another country uh, for a semester, being able to work in a co-working space, maybe have some some help and then uh, continue to work, but then be somewhere else a little bit. Um, it really triggers a lot of things for creativity when you change your when you change your your environment, at least for me, when you change your environment many times, it just triggers a lot of different emotions that just makes you more creative. It's a bit like how babies are or children's are, uh, where they are much, their children are a lot in their uh, present moment because everything is new to them and then they learn and they grow. And I would say for me, it's been quite similar where as soon as I change location, there's kind of a, a creative flow that comes through that is just much better if I change the the weather you know if you if it's grim outside for three months and you're locked in for a year like it's definitely <laughs> gonna be extremely difficult to um to keep that creativity going if you're always locked in and you're in your own house but then if you move somewhere else and you go by it doesn't have to be the beach you know, it can just be like in the woods you go work in the woods for a week and then you're close to you have an internet connection and you work but definitely with kids you you do need help like there is it's been a very hard year for parents so yeah for sure definitely, yeah. well and I, I can sort of speak to that too I mean you know the first time we took our kids to Europe you know so five years ago was the first time our boys had ever been out of the U.S. you know we travel a lot in this country I guess we went to Canada once but like Vancouver it may as well be you know, an extension of America, not so culturally different. But um, but when we took the kids to Europe and we took the kids through Spain, especially, uh, you know, just like you said, this sort of childlike wonderment, right? It's just sort of the mm-hmm. awe that you have of things that are new and different. And and so I think that that's a really valuable experience, you know, A, as a remote working, remote working parent who can maybe have the opportunity to take your kids to see new parts of the world or new, you know, new countries, new cultures, new, whatever. Um, I think that's, you know, really impactful for kids. I mean, our, our boys talk about that first trip all the time. Like it just happened, you know, I mean, it's like Disneyland for them, you know? And, uh, and so, I mean, I think it's really important to have that experience and I can sort of, uh, empathize or, or sympathize or, I, I don't know. I have the same same feeling that you're describing, which is, you know, when you get to this new place, there is sort of a rush of creative uh, output. You know, I, I have found that in the, in my year or so that I've been back in the house since COVID, um, you know, before I uh, will hopefully be returning to co- uh, rem- or co-working here pretty quick. But um, but I, I've noticed a real decline in sort of my, you know, creative output and my ability to ideate and things like this, you know, and a large part of it is just me being alone all day, even though I, I talk mm-hmm. to people through Slack and I'm on Skype and I'm, you know, all the play all over all the time. Ultimately, I still turn around and it's just me, you know, and it's uh, and I found that that's had a real negative effect on sort of my personality in general and sort of my output, uh, you know, uh, specifically. Mm hmm. So let's talk a little bit then sort of as we're talking about the um, pandemic and sort of the, the I guess, post-pandemic, hopefully, you know, uh, I know there are still some hot spots around the world, so trying to be sensitive to that. But for, for many people, you know, they're starting to get to the other side of this, thank goodness. And, uh, you know, as a result, a lot of people are going back to work. You know, um, there's this phrase that people keep throwing around that just drives <clears throat> me bonkers, which is this idea of the new normal. And, uh, and for me, I think it pays like an absolute disservice to everybody who's suffered through COVID. I mean, I feel like basically at this point, everybody's been traumatized. So to pretend that we're just going to sweep it under the rug and go back to normal is mm-hmm. I think kind of offensive actually. <laughs> but, um, but I think where we're at is, you know, there's obviously going to be change and, and whatever becomes our new normal is, uh, is going to be different. And one of the things that's sort of a hot button item today, and I think this is actually sort of going to play into some of your strengths is this idea of the rush back to work or let's get everybody back into the office. You know, let's do things the way we used to do. And I think for most remote work advocates, they sort of don't see that going down that way. But I wonder if you talk a little bit about your perspective on where you think we're going from here, what, what this ramp back up to sort of, I guess, hopefully full production, if you weren't already at full production is. And, uh, I wonder if you could just sort of talk about that and then, you know, we can start digging into that topic a little bit. Of course. The first thing is you said back to work which to me is like, so we've not been working for a year and a half and many people are saying that we're doing the back to work plan. We are, you know, it's like back to school or back to work, but then it's not back to work. You've been working for a year and a half. 
remotely, you've been doing things, you're going back to the office or you're going back to another way of working, but you're not going back to work. You've been, you've been working for, for that all this time. Um, I mean, we don't know how it is going to be. And I am, I am quite curious to know, to observe this back to the office um, procedure is happening because many people are thinking that it's just going to be back to normal, as you're saying, or it's just going to be okay. We will have some people working remotely once in a while, and then we have the office to, we can do it because we made it for a year. You didn't do that. You worked in an office for 10 years. You worked remotely um, for a year and a half. In these two eras, all employees were in the same ground. They were in the same setup, the same reality. And then in the remote phase, you were also all in the same reality. So you were able to adjust to one another because you were all in the same boat. Once you were going to have some people who are in office and remote, if there is a tendency to be office first, I'm telling you that these people will fail. They won't like remote work. They won't think that it's working. They will feel like there is a big disconnect. There will be a lot of management crisis there as well. There will be another new trauma <laughs> that we're talking about where those who said, well, you said you, I could work from, from home from now on, but now like I have no idea what's going on. Like I really feel like I'm missing out or, you know, if they don't put the right processes in place, it, it won't work. The reason is it's, it depends. If you want to go back to the office, do it, go back to the office all the way. And then you choose, we want to be an office company do it. Some people might think, actually, no, I want to stay in that lifestyle and I will go somewhere else. That's fine. You know, some people will decide to just come back to the office and have that kind of um, work culture. But if you want to do both, be very careful that it's not about, it's not about being together. It's about the, the processes and the collaboration framework you put in place to make sure that teams are um, kind of have an equity of work, that they are all in the same boat. So if you don't do that, then it will always have a disbalance of those in the office, those at home, and then you will feel like a teammate apart. <laughs> like you said. Oh, I love that. Thanks for the plug. That's amazing. Um, no, I think, you know, if there's anything, you know, for trying to look at silver, silver, uh, silver linings or positive things that came out of COVID uh, as it pertains to remote work, one thing I think that if anybody was on the fence about whether remote work worked for them or didn't, um, mm-hmm. I think this was a terrific opportunity to find out. Right. So I think, you know, in the sort of the before time, as I call it, you know, there were people who sort of had an inclination for remote work, you know, Mm -hmm. and they they tend to have a set of skills or whatever that sort of lean into wanting to remote uh, work remotely. And then there's a set of people that just aren't interested. Right. They just it's not for them. It's not the kind of thing they're looking for. They like the separation between work and life or, or whatever. Right. And so I think that, you know, if, if there's something positive that came out of COVID, it's that for a lot of employer or a lot of employees, I think they were capable of making a decision now. They can sort mm-hmm. of say, okay, I liked remote. That was awesome. Or I like it some of the time, or I like it none of the time. And, you know, I'd like to go back to work uh, or back to the office. To the office. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Jeez. I'm going to keep triggering you with that one. Um, <laughs> um, so, but the, uh, but the idea I think anyway, is that, you know, people have now are, are I guess, so, sort of informed, right? Maybe before you weren't informed, you'd never had the opportunity to work from home, but now you're informed. Now, you know, and I think for yeah. a lot of people, you know, there, there's probably a, a pretty significant amount of people who, like we were describing with sort of, you know, taking young kids to different parts of the world. I mean, they've, they've had their eyes opened to a different way of working and, and, uh, and I think that that, you know, experience in and of itself is what's going to make it really difficult for people to just try and pretend that this whole COVID thing never happened. Right. You've got too many people now who've seen kind of behind the veil, I guess, you know, and for some, it didn't work out. They just, you know, are excited to get back to their desk. But, um, you know, but for a lot of people, I think that there's going to be some sort of hybrid plan. And I think anybody who's mm-hmm. being sort of, you know, intellectually honest about what returning to work looks like, I think hybrid is probably where we're at. Yeah, definitely. And one thing I see a lot at the moment is, so with people say, okay, it's going to be the future of work is hybrid. And right now in the podcast, um, I'm really focusing on hybrid for season two, is that people have very different definition of what hybrid is. And for many, hybrid is a kind of... um, a split uh, or binary thing where it's like, oh, we're hybrid. We have people can be in office three days a week and then two days a week remote. 
but then still, uh, you know, it's still a, a culture of work that is hub based, you know, a hub culture of you live around the office and you kind of need to be around the office to be part of the company is still quite office first. And there's another definition of hybrid, which to me fits more, is what you would think about companies like Elastic, companies like uh, GitHub or Dropbox or all the big names that are been moving and wanting a bit of a hybrid approach is that they still keep some real estate office um, space, but they are distributed by design. They The way they work and the way that the culture of work is, or the processes is made to think of including remote workers or distributed workers the same way as office workers. So the way the office is designed, the way the office is used is always thinking of employees working in digitally first. And that's definitely like the best approach that you can have in making sure that you are building a way of working that just is equivalent for everyone and there is no teammate apart or no one that it feels like they are out of the loop because they're not in the office. No one who's not, who's feeling that they won't get promoted if they're not in the office. Um, a big difference also is the companies who are going hybrid, but, but most of the leadership team decides to be uh, remote or, or, or distributed. Um, giving the example of you can have a, uh, a role that is, you know, um, a senior role and still be remote. You won't lose that opportunity. And that's just so important um, for, for the next companies who are wanting to go hybrid to think it's not going to be just a, a, a workplace that changes. It has to be what kind of company do we want to be? How are we working to make that work long term and still give the office as a tool, as an extra tool, like you're using tool for your day-to-day work, um, using all these elect- like uh, Zoom and, and project management tools and collaboration tools. The office is another tool. It's a tool for creativity and innovation and collaboration and bringing people together. It's a tool for socializing, to create um, connections with the people you're working with. There's no way the companies that you see that are fully remote do meet together at least once a year in a big retreat or maybe quarterly through meetups. And it makes a big difference. When I used to see my my teammates every other quarter in a conference or something like that and have some time together, have a drink or just hang, hang out a little bit, I create connection. And this is very difficult still to, to create online. You There is no way that you can keep a fully remote company without ever seeing them and then feel connected with them. You do need to have some sort of uh, in-person and that's what the office is going to be very useful in, in the in the future is going to be to create these social connection and just feel um, a bit of the vibe of your company to be in the office with the branding sometimes is that's it and people like that kind of feel of being in the hub of the brand and then other people just like to have um, a good you know drink or lunch with the with people and then uh, take it a bit more easy um, if I can continue on this, you'll also see, I think this is a, I'm kind of like giving you a bit of my vision of how I see it, this happening is people will go into hybrid and then people will say, oh, we have a massive amount of people going back to the office. We're realizing the stats are showing us that people actually want the office. They like the office after like three, four months of hybrid. And, and then you'll be like, Oh, so people don't want to be remote, but that's not the case. What's real? What's happening is that we've been having a whole population of millions of people who were locked in for months of not being able to socialize, and then suddenly they can socialize. I would the first one be going to an office to be able to work <laughs> with other people. Like I am a social person, I would definitely go all the time just to be around people. So we have to keep that in mind, and there will be a transition like this, and then after that to see, okay, now that we've come back together, felt that trust, felt that felt that connection, how does it feel to open it and distribute it and then have some people out, outside or distributed in other locations and some coming in the office? How are you going to make this work so that everybody's on the same level? Yeah, no, I think you're right. And and there's actually, you know, several things in there I'd like to sort of unpack or point out. And, and you know, one of those things, just as you mentioned, this idea of, you know, kind of a 
at an, almost like an elastic rebound back into the office, you know, where people are just really anxious to get uh, some people time. You know, I mean, one of our core things just as people is, you know, looking for security or safety, right? And, you know, it's difficult to feel safe when you're totally out of control of what's happening on in the, you know, going on in the environment or in your community, uh, when you're, you know, locked in your home and you can't, you know, move ab- about freely like you once did, stuff like that. Like, it's really tough to feel secure and feel safe, you know? And so going back to the office, even if it is short lived, you know, just for this moment of connection with other humans. And, and these are the people you've been talking to online for a year, you know, now you get a, you know, an opportunity to get together. I think that's really important. And I think it really feeds into that sort of human need for safety or security. So I, I, I love that. I also wanted to point out that the, you use the phrase distributed by design. And, uh, I think that plus, you know, sort of just the, the other kind of buzzy word, this idea of being remote first, um, You know, structuring your business that way, I think what's really interesting about it, especially as we're talking about sort of equity or equality across, you know, of of everybody's, I guess, opportunity to interact with the company, um, building your company in a remote first way doesn't seem to work in the opposite direction, right? If you if you were trying to do the opposite, if you're trying to build your company in an office first way, it's just not as inclusive, right? So even if your team, let's say, doesn't largely work remote, by building your company in a remote first way, nonetheless, you have established all the sort of, you know, norms around communication and the way we do meetings and the way that we uh, document things, that all that stuff. And, you know, by being sort of remote first, even if it's not your entire focus, like it honestly could make you a better company or a stronger company. Definitely, actually, just the fact that for a year and a half, people have been trying to make their process better, more efficient, communicate better. Even if you were to be mostly office based at the end, and then you might decide that this is what you want um, and have some people remote, just the fact that you've adapted your way of working to be much more organized and transparent and um, easy to access information, just to do that in your own company, even if you were never remote, would make your company extremely more um, productive and efficient. So that's something I'm, I'm hoping that this actually created a lot of opportunities for companies to think, hey, realizing that going remote, we realize that our company is actually, you know, very messy and we really have a lot of problems with communications. Many people realize that the system they had in place and the way they were working was really not efficient because now they didn't have the like, you know, just nudge someone to get your information. This is how we work here. When you realize you don't have that anymore, you have to think, okay, the processes in the company are not working. They are really not efficient and we have to um, put new processes in place. And this is where if you do think remote first, it does make you force it, it forces it to make it uh, every every little steps in the company, the way you're working are thought, are thought through. And this makes a big difference, even if you were not to, if, even if you were deciding that you would work in an office for now, from now on. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's a, a great point. And I think it's sort of, you know, again, if we're looking for silver linings from sort of this, uh, you know, pandemic period, you know, if you are a company who took advantage of this time and did improve those processes and all that stuff, I mean, ultimately you're going to come out much more resilient, right? You're going to be mm-hmm. much more prepared for whatever the future has in store. I mean, God forbid, let's say another pandemic or something was to occur. I mean, now you have everything in place. People know how to communicate. You've set rules and barriers. You've set boundaries. You you know how to work when you're not in the office together. You know, like, I mean, you're, you're so much more resilient as a company and as a leader, you know, than you have maybe ever been. And so, uh, so I think that that's a, a real positive and something to think about. Um, I want to maybe try and, uh, you know, wrap some definitions around this. We talked about this a little bit before, but you know, you and I right now are talking about this idea of remote first. Uh, if we're a organization that, you know, maybe hasn't traditionally been remote, although it's interesting, if you really break down what you do day to day, you probably do a lot of kind of remote stuff. It's funny. I had a a call with another guy just earlier today that uh, runs a, what he calls sort of, well, I call also a virtual agency. So I work in the advertising and marketing space a lot. And uh, so did this guy. And we were talking about running a virtual agency. And we were talking about just, you know, the good old days back in the traditional agencies. And, you know, really half your team was traveling. They were at the client's place. They were in New York. They were, you know, wherever they were. But like, 
all the, or many of the things that you would do in remote work were necessitated just to keep the business going. Right. And so I think for employers who might be a little timid or a little afraid to step into this, and this is something I've sort of observed throughout the, the crisis was that people were kind of dipping one toe into remote, but they weren't going all the way in, you know, maybe they mm-hmm. had in the back of their mind, they were going to go back to what it was and they didn't need to adapt or, you know, Oh, we'll get through this in no time. There's no need to really get all crazy about it. We'll just, you know, shut down for a couple of weeks and we'll be back to business. And, uh, and so I think that there was some mentality stuff, uh, shifts that were required there, but I wonder, so if you're a company and you, you are trying to adapt to be a sort of, you know, take a business, not traditionally remote first and make it into one that is, where would you begin? How would you start to, uh, advise a leadership team or management teams or whatever to, to move forward in a remote first sort of way? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, it has to start from the intention that you have because I'm not I'm not there to convince anyone. Like the first thing first, you have to be convinced yourself this is what you want to do as a company. So if the first thing, like I work with um, in finance companies, for example, that, uh, you know, ex- went into the, the pandemic, experienced some of it and like, okay, now we want to like make the whole company remote first. We want to change all our processes so that's like an example but they they tried it first so that's why they are convinced but i'm not there to be like you have to be remote this is this this is the answer there's no other way you can work like this is not um how i am even if i sometimes you know i've been called a remote work preacher in the back in the, in the past <laughs> uh when it was like the beginning and i was really into that convincing mode because now it was great you don't have to convince anyone anymore um but usually it starts, the first thing that people usually work is, you know, how is the organization working? Like, how is the way we are working? And what are like the drop points where we are feeling that we might have uh, problems with the, um, the fact that people are not all together and the way you're culturally working? If your culture of work is that you're onboarding someone new and you said that, tell that person, oh, to learn here, you just have to like, ask around and then learn by yourself remotely you'll have a lot of difficulty because you'll get managers that are going to be like overly prompt with notifications all the time with people coming in and needing information and being always repeating themselves so first thing first is create processes across the company make people empowered to take um to take um make people empowered to take initiatives on how they will document or write down all the processes around where they are working and then after around the topic that they are that they are covering for example if you're the marketing team or you're the product team or the engineering team you all have different processes to work and clarify these processes and then it's it's mostly around making sure that everything is clear and transparent um so yeah, I think that usually it starts a lot with the process, the documentation of the company and making a way for people to access information easily. Then there is also culturally, how is their company working? Is your company more of a, you know, top down where there's a lot of things that are kept secret for the leadership team and then you have like the rest of the company? Or is it a company that's transparent, that is open? Usually successful remote companies work in the open, we say. So that most of the information is available to anyone at any time and can be accessed it can be accessed easily. So be it, for example, if you started a communication framework, for example, you could start with how are we using day-to-day Slack? How do we want that to be? Uh, do we want this to be the hub where we were working, which I don't necessarily think is the right idea, <laughs> or do we want something to be more social? And back and forth for like uh, once in a while, back and forth. Do I have a place to have conversations or discussions that can be asynchronous so that everybody can um, access a conversation from wherever they want? Um, If you could take an example, if somebody wants to go read about the topic, the way um, Automatic work, and they built a product called P2, which was like one of the first products you've seen that were thread-based kind of blog for companies. We built something similar to that in the company I used to work for. And this is where you have a thread of conversation. You would basically post a message that might be a long form message where normally you would send an email to all the employees where people are used to be like, I need to ask a question. I'm just going to send an email to everyone and see who answers me. 
<laughs> this is just like I have a suggestion about something I'd like to change or like I want to work on this and need some feedback. You post something there and then there's an opportunity for people to comment and then to basically say um, what they think about the thoughts that you brought in and then have a conversation. But it's not a instant message. It's a comment based. So then you don't have the feeling that you need to be always on to be able to have um, access to these, these conversation and be part or make an impact. You can make an impact even if you're... Um, if you're remote, there's many other things that companies need to look at, but um, this is mostly about the like way of working. It's just so important to think about how how you're wanting it to be, and and as after that, there's all the other things. There's like talent, employment. Are you wanting to employ only in, inside of your company? Why are you doing this? Is it because you want to have a bigger pool of uh, of employees? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a lifestyle. Uh, thing for the company if it is because you want a bigger pool are you wanting an international pool or are you okay to stay in your area um, many people today are like you have to go fully remote and hire from all around the world but why you're not doing remote work and that's completely false like in the end there is a lot of diversity in all the hubs where we work and it's actually much easier to manage a remote company if you're time zone based if you're deciding that we're going to hire remote folks from, for example, if you're located in, in the U.S., you could say all the Americas. The All the Americas, can you imagine how many people that is? This is much more than your like, surrounding of, for example, the city of Boston and just be like, we just hire around Boston. Like This is massive amount of people that you're hiring just in that time zone. After that, there's a question of, okay, if you do want to hire in a time zone, specific there's tons of countries there there's a lot of regulations and laws of unemployment this doesn't mean you can hire full-time and contractors all the time so there's that thought as well like how how big do you want the remote to be and it's totally fine for companies to say you know what we're based in europe we will open for certain european countries to increase our pool our pool but we will just say that way we just just make it clear on your um, when you're hiring remote employers, remote employees. Make it clear when you're hiring remote employees that you have a specific location where you can hire and you cannot hire outside of these locations because this is very frustrating for somebody who gets into a, a a process for getting hired to realize late in the process that they cannot hire you because of your location. Right. That's yeah. another thing. <clears throat> no, and that's a great point. I actually just saw it yesterday, um, it, or or in the last couple of days, we had uh, a guy on the podcast, Tony Jamus, who's from uh, Oyster, yeah. and Oyster's hiring policy is kind of like that. They they basically will hire within five hours, I think it is, of mm -hmm. uh, of their sort of headquarters, which I believe is in San Francisco. So you can go five hours either direction, but that's all they can do. And, uh, you know, but they, they put that right on their website. It's easily understood all that stuff. And hopefully I'm not messing that up or speaking out of school, but that's how I read it. And, uh, and so, but that was, you know, again, back to the idea of transparency, that was one of the more transparent approaches I've seen because I've seen a lot of things that are, Oh, hire anyone anywhere, you know, we're totally remote. We're totally whatever, you know, and, uh, I've not often seen it sort of corralled that way where yes, we're fully remote. We're a fully distributed company, but you know, we need to be able to touch base at least at one point during the day. So if you're within this five hour mm -hmm our window then we can do that you there's know. one company that very well um spotify at the moment are i think a really good example of setting up good boundaries and be very clear about them they are the policy of work from anywhere but are very clear on like these are the locations where you can be hired these are locations that otherwise under, we cannot hire you from there and also there's limits of if you want to change location, for example, if you're an employee who wants to change location uh, for a year or two, and then after you want to move somewhere else, they want to make sure that everywhere you work will always be compliant. And they think about, you know, all the the, the location is necessarily compliant to stay there for a while. You need to declare when you're going to be working from it's going to be for a long term. So they still make it like, yes, there is, you know, leverage to be able to to travel or to work remotely and then have a bit of a lifestyle. But you need to be organized when you work for when you're not a freelancer anymore. There's a bit more to, to take into account that is, you know, the company is responsible of you in some way when you're working. Yeah. 
No, I think that makes sense. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on this. So one issue that's come up, you know, for companies, especially uh, who are now beginning to adopt remote, but maybe weren't set up that way in the first place, as you start to expand across time zones and maybe across countries or geographic locations where there's maybe some disparity, economically speaking, what kind of, uh, or how, how do you think companies can sort of approach this financial factor? You know, for example, the, the example that uh, it came to mind was, you know, Facebook saying, we'll pay you X number of dollars if you continue to live in San Francisco. But if you go live in Montana, we're going to cut your salary down to whatever's commensurate in Montana. Mm-hmm. You know, where maybe other organizations, they don't look at that factor and you're, you know, you're allowed to sort of just make whatever you make for this position, mm-hmm. regardless of where you happen to live. How do you think employers or organizations can sort of, you know, mitigate that? Or do you have any thoughts around pay for people? I mean, that's a very big debate. Like, it's so divided. Like, I actually love to even debate about this with people. Usually, I'm just like, so what do you think? Like, are you, like, more for, like, transparent salary? Or are you for not transparent? Are you location-based or not? Is that What's the right thing? And I wouldn't say I have the answer yet. Like, I think there is so many options. It just depends on the company. I would understand a company like Facebook or these massive companies that, been pay, I've been paying San Francisco salaries for years because this was the cost of being able to bring people in, in their location. This location is extremely expensive and this is the only way they, they can have them in is to pay San Francisco salaries. Um, I wonder who will take the drop in salary to move somewhere else. Um, well, and I, I honestly look at the alternative to that too. What if I'm a guy growing up in Montana and well, San Francisco is expensive, but you know what's worse? Downtown Manhattan. So I live in Manhattan Mm. or I live in Tokyo or I live in, you know, I'm going to go to one of these great places that's really expensive so that I could get a massive raise. Is that how that works then? I don't think so. I think that, I mean, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what time, how they are, they are dealing with that situation. But in the end, like I've been myself deciding to, I would have like a salary that was sometime some sort of location based just according to like the average in that area. Um, yeah. You but know, then we decide to be in Asia for six months and then be like, I'm now I'm rolling and I'm feeling rich. <laughs> because yeah. I'm like living in this amazing villa with a pool. And, you know, it's just, uh, it, it depends, it depends what you want to do with it. But in real life, you know, it is, there was a big benefit before as being a remote worker that you could decide to have a New York job and then live in Vermont, for example, and have a massive house. This is like a, a friend of mine who exactly had that kind of thing where she bought a massive house in Vermont and had a really nice setup there instead of having a tiny flat in New York. And good for her. Like, I think it's it's a good thing or like, um, another company you have two different founders. One, uh, you know, one lives in a countryside. Another one lives in a city that's quite expensive. Another one lives in a medium city, but they all give themselves the same salary. But they just choose what's more important to them. Some people, it's more important for them to be in the city, in the big um, noise and 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 you know, life of the city. Other people like to be in the countryside. So yeah. it just. Yeah. It depends on what you and want. I think that that feels the most like what's fair to me anyway. Like I sort of, it, you know, and maybe it's just because I come from a, a design background where basically in our company, for example, we don't charge by the hour, we charge by the project, right? So mm-hmm. every, every project we do is assessed a value and that value is what it is, what it's worth. Right. So, I mean, we might do a logo for you, but you know, based on the size of your company and where you're located and how much, you know, what your sales look like, that logo might be, you know, very expensive, where if you come to us and we decide to take the work for a much smaller company, you know, maybe the work will be less, but nonetheless, it's a flat rate. You know, you pay what you pay and this is the value of that product. And I think mm-hmm. for a lot of companies, you know, it might serve them to actually look at the value a person brings to an organization and then price on that. You know, especially given that, you know, so much of remote work is output based. You know, we're looking at your mm-hmm. outputs. We're not looking at the number of hours you spend necessarily. Rather, it's what you actually produce, what you get out. So I, I think there might be something to that idea of assessing what your output is worth. You know, I mean, if you're and maybe it's easier in some divisions, right? I mean, if you're the the people behind the software that you sell or if you're the people on the marketing team, like there's some metrics that make it pre- maybe pretty easy. Where if you're mm-hmm. somebody who, I don't know, works a virtual front desk or answers phones all day, maybe that's not seen as, as valuable or something. So maybe it's not totally the right solution. But I think that maybe something around that where 
you know, you actually assess the value of you, uh, of your position to the company maybe is a, is a mm-hmm. way to do that. So regardless of where you live, like you said, you can prioritize based on what's important to you. Do I want to mm-hmm. live in the city? Great. Well, I, I still make X number of dollars. So that's, you know, however far that will go in the city is how far that goes in the city. Mm-hmm. If I want to live in, in, you know, a little town in Wyoming or something, you know, I'll be, I'll be rolling in it. So uh, it might be something, an effect I'm thinking might happen is, maybe salaries will drop a bit from the tech industry that was kind of like really well-paid roles and, you know, working in tech was very you know, lucrative. And maybe what you'll see is that, well, maybe the salaries become a bit more average and then that's basically what will, what will happen. Mm-hmm. So. Um, yeah. And I think that's okay. As long as it's not one of these deals where it's, Hey, we're going to pay you less because now you have the perk of working remote. I, that always makes me crazy when people look at, you know, being remote as a perk of the job. So for some reason we should pay you less, like your output is now worth less or something. And mm-hmm. so, uh, so that's one of those things where I think there's like a, a sticking point around that idea. Yeah. And there's another person I saw on LinkedIn, I think, or on Twitter saying that it's really important that people start, that companies start to put themselves the salary on their, their listing, mostly because, you should, the company should assess what exactly you said, what's the value of that role, what is how much it, it is, and then people will know accordingly and not have the dance of salary negotiation and relocation and all. It's like, this is the role, this is the cost, and then um, and that's it. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I can't tell you how many job postings I come across where it's, you know, pay dependent on experience or, you know, whatever. And, you know, when you see that sort of thing, I mean, it's almost not fair to ask a person to jump through all the hoops of employment, you know, filling out cover letters and sending in resumes and, you know, recording video interviews and do, you know, all these different things that people are asking of uh, prospective employees these days. You know, it doesn't seem fair to ask for all that stuff for them to find out that even at the maximum of your scale, you're way below what I will accept for the work, you Mm -hmm. know, like, and so I think, uh, you know, back to that idea or that concept of transparency, I think. I think that's really important. Um, I wonder moving forward, I wonder if we can still, you know, talking, I guess, largely to companies who are now making this change and need to start being a little bit more remote, remote first. There's obviously the, the things that we've been just des- describing co- sort of culturally, the, you know, how do we, uh, you know, how do we react to different methods of communication? Uh, you know, what do we do when we're setting meetings? How do, you know, how are meetings managed, that sort of stuff. But, you know, what are some challenges that people are running into as they start to implement these things? I mean, have you come across in your consultative work, any, I guess, real challenges or roadblocks that are stopping companies from being able to do that stuff? I mean, there's been a lot of struggle in the past year. There's people that have been touching remote work for the first time and have been completely out of their comfort zone. And the first thing that happened is that they tried, of course, to recreate the office in a remote setup um, and then end up with a notification overload and just not just not being able to keep track of everything, feel like they're always on calls, feel they're always ping from everywhere. Um, just basically jumping in, you know, I closed like many, many, many did wish this normal, you know, they had to do that and they just did whatever they could to to fix. Uh, they didn't know it would be for so long. So it's just like, oh, it's just temporary. So just let's uh, figure it out. But the main thing usually is, you know, people have to think about how can they leverage their work time and their notifications um, set up so that they don't get overloaded with messages coming in all the time, all day long and feeling like you always need to be on on Slack, for example, uh, being on meetings all the time because you feel like this is the only way you can w- get work done. You just feel like you will have like one hour meeting back to back and then you just end up with nothing done for the day. You just spoke all day. And then is there a way for the work that you've been doing to be done a bit more asynchronously or with more preparation? So there's a lot of these meetings that could just be prepared more in advance. Like there is actually, you know, a meeting should have an agenda of like, why are we doing this meeting? And also sometimes it's good to have some homework before then. Just even if it wasn't an office, I think I would prefer to have like meetings that actually have a value and a reason, a reasoning behind it. So if people come prepared with like already their ideas written down of like what they want to bring to the meeting. And then after that, bringing it all together, we come to a decision after like back and forth a little bit, done, we're finished. 
this is written somewhere, you put it online, and then some other people can have a look at it and probably maybe can comment on it and be like, oh, what about this? What about that? And the conversation can continue even online. I think this kind of like processes and way um, of collaborating will make a big difference on being able to actually feel like you're not overloaded with this massive amount of, of notifications everywhere. Yeah. And I think too, that goes back to this, this idea of, you know, I guess leading with a remote first mentality or the, our, our buzzword, which has actually become kind of a drinking game this season is this idea of intention, you know, that, you know, Mm -hmm. by having proper intention in the first place, some of the roadblocks that might've gotten in your way aren't going to be there. You know, like if, if you had had set your mind on building an office type situation remotely, you know, you might be imposing problems that wouldn't occur otherwise if you were actually thinking about doing it in a remote first way. So I think that makes a lot of sense. One of the things I wanted to talk to you too about though, is what do you think is the role of the employer in sort of I guess our employee happiness, right. Or employee satisfaction. Mm-hmm. So when we moved immediately into COVID, there was a lot of, you know, uh, re- virtual happy hours and remote game nights and all this kind of stuff, right. Where it was like zoom, zoom meetings all day and all night, right. Like all day zoom meetings. And so, and that led to a lot of fatigue and a lot of overwhelm and stuff like that. And I think it all came from a good place, right. Employers were trying to do the right thing by people. They were trying to make people feel, feel good. Um, but I think what ended up happening was actually ended up burning out a lot of people on this kind of thing. And so I wonder, what do you think, especially in a remote environment, how much of your, I guess, sort of social good feelings need to come from an employer versus should you be taking on on your own? You know, when you check out from work for the day, you go meet a friend for coffee or something like how, where do you see that sort of balancing out? I mean, I think you said it all there. Like, you know, people have been doing happy hours and all these things because, they were missing each other because they were not they were not used to it and just needed to find a way to get out of the isolation or find a way to like how do we get our team together now we need to you know be creative and be together all the time and have uh, the fun things that we used to have in the office the ping pong table and the like lunch break and coffee break and drink after hours and but then people don't want that people like in the end um it, it's it's not all about creating happy hours that will make employee happiness in quote like and usually the the most successful um, employee experience that are like that are usually employee driven if the employees themselves organize you know sessions of having like fun for that or like let's do that and you give a a bit of space for employees themselves who take these initiatives maybe they can have a budget of something they can do or organize something and you have sometime maybe a a culture team that you can call sometimes and have, you know, that do kind of put in place these kind of activities. But in the end, of course, that we're not living in the era that is naturally letting you have a lot of social times outside of work. Um, So you do need to have, I think as an employee, you know, your own, you need to take care of yourself. Like when before, when I was working remote in the normal, the real normal remote work, I would have still time of loneliness. And I used to give talks about remote work and always say that the main challenges are usually loneliness, lack of awareness of each other. Um, There is a lot of challenges that's come with remote work and there's a responsibility as an employee and an employer to take care of each other. There's a lot of work to be done around emotional intelligence and empathy remotely and being able to, to kind of have an eye for, hey, I'm seeing that my teammate doesn't look like he's doing right or she's doing right. You're starting when you get more experience at working on video a lot or like the way that you're writing to start getting cues about how is your team doing. And it's just very important to be extremely aware about this. Um, usually what helps a lot is to do much more one-on-ones that are really based on the person well-being and the, the how that person is doing at not just at work but just in their own life just so you can have a bit of a you know a feeling of like what what they're going through at the moment they might have like a, the, the illness in their family they might have uh, difficulties that they you would normally see if they were next to you in an office you would see them coming in and be like maybe close to crying or like um feel like they are like a bit uh, tense in their in their energy because there's stress. You would actually be able to 
feel these cues and you don't have that remotely. So you need to, I think as an employee an employer to show that you are open for people to speak up and you create a space for people to be able to open up and employee happiness or employee experience is just not all about virtual happy hours. It's a lot more about how the person feels and if they feel like they are able to speak up and kind of bring them their whole self at work uh, some days where maybe they don't feel like they're having a great day. And it's just important that they are able to do that. They're able to say really how, how it's going for them. Well, and maybe that's it, right? Maybe that's a cultural value that employers need to consider is it's not so much about, hey, I need you to help me, right? I don't need you to hold that happy hour so that I have someone to hang out with. Rather, it's give me a place where I'm safe enough to feel how I feel today or, you know, encourage me to take some time for myself to go do this or that, you know, allow for that self-care component. Um, You know, when I talk about uh, remote work with a, a lot of people, I talk about, you know, the opportunity that we have you know, especially for those of us who have careers that are sort of bound to a desk or bound to, you know, standing at a workstation all day. Um, you know, I mean, for a lot of remote workers, they have the opportunity to do more with self-care and, you know, maybe take some time to meditate or take some time to go for a walk or, or do something uh, fitness uh, oriented. And I think, you know, for employers, a lot of, especially, and maybe this is me being jaded uh, from the advertising industry, but a lot of stuff that gets brought in are, you know, uh, coolers full of Red Bulls and ping pong mm-hmm. tables and caffeinated nuts and whatever, but it's all geared at keeping you at work longer, right? We don't want you to leave for lunch, hurry up and eat your lunch so that you can get back to your desk or eat your lunch at your desk. That would be great. Then you can keep working. And so, so many of these things are sort of, I mean, they're done in a way that's, you know, thoughtful. They're trying to make the experience of the employee better, you know, by giving you food and giving you, you know, all this stuff. I mean, they're trying to be nice, but I think ultimately what it does or effectively what it does is it keeps people at work longer. And I think that that was sort of one of the negative effects of these virtual happy hours and all that stuff is you already had a day where for so many remote workers, they struggle to keep boundaries and, and, you know, only check email during certain times and stuff like that. And then now you're telling them come back after work for a virtual after hours thing, like, mm-hmm. you know, and this is my 12th meeting on the, on zoom today and, and that kind of thing. So I think even though it's, um, you know, comes from a good spot. I think if employers really try and shift that perspective to, uh, you know, really uh, put an emphasis on the importance of self-care and and that you are allowed to, you know, take time to go be social, take time to go, you know, do what you need to do for your mental health, take time to, to go, uh, you know, and it, just go for a walk, you know, do what you need to do. Mm-hmm. And I think moving to a system where we're not counting your hours, but we're counting your output certainly would, uh, would assist that. But that's exactly what flexible hours is all about, like in the end and where if you have a system in place that allows people to work asynchronously or not having to be like, you know, in Zoom meeting all the time and you just say like you can do your schedule the way you want. And if you feel like you're more productive in the morning and then the afternoon, you need to go out because you need to take some fresh air while it's sunny, you know, because this is the right time to go outside and then you come back later, it just needs to be accepted in the company as well, not just as a as a manager or as a, an, as a leader of a company of the leadership team by a person, the company culture needs to accept that there's flexible hours. I see companies who call themselves having flexible hours. And even those who were not remote before had these, you know, rooms of ping pong tables and uh, football table and uh, all these, all the, these different things, even gaming and everything but then you would have actually gossip inside of the company of like, oh, that developer is always playing ping pong. And then just like very toxic culture where there is no real flexible hours because people are like, oh, we have all these deadlines, but then they're only playing ping pong. And then there's a bit of like, you know, yeah, toxicity there, which is the end if it's not understood a whole company and that people don't do it properly. It's just, it can, it can create a bit of a, yeah, b- a bad culture there as well. Like in the end, it just needs to be quite clear in a whole company that, okay, we are a company that offers an office. There is some play area. We have that part of the company, but you can also work remote a little bit if you want. You can go for a two hour lunch break if you want. It's totally fine. And then the whole team needs to basically, everybody needs to be a bit accountable from each other though. You know, there's a way that, 
it plays both ways. You're giving, you're, you're being getting a lot of um, extra care and benefits and all these things to, you know, make your life uh, easier for you, you know, be accountable on, on the work you're doing, of course, um, uh, on, on making sure that you are, you know, hitting these deadlines, if this is what it needs to be done, or if you do feel like, hey, I cannot do that deadline, I'm actually quite overwhelmed, um, I'm dealing with all these different things, say it up front, just the most transparency you have in this environment, the better it's going to be for, for you and for your company. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think it's also a great point to go out on. Um, Daphne, here at the end, do you want to let people know where they can learn more about you, maybe find you online or engage with your uh, your practice if they should feel so inclined? Yeah, sure. Um, the best way to contact me is really on LinkedIn. So you just search for my name, Daphne Laforet, and then I'm basically there every single day. It's like my social network, basically. And you can also find me on the Remote First podcast where I have an episode every week. Um, yeah, that's basically where I live. So i um, happy to always help or, or chat with people. I'm always excited to discuss the remote work and its future. Great. And we'll make sure to include those notes in the, or the, uh, those links in our show notes so that people can find you. And uh, yeah, just thank you so much for doing this. I'm, re- I'm really grateful to have had you on. And uh, I think there was some, uh, some great stuff in there. Thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. And thanks to everybody who tunes in this week and every week. And we'll see everybody next time. I don't know you anything.